Um, and then reducing hazards, uh, we'll go over these as well, but um, cats, window strikes, pesticide use, et cetera. And like I said, we have four levels of habitat as we have always had. So hummingbird is kind of your level one introductory, which is great for people with apartments or small yards. It only takes a few native plants um, and a feeder. Uh, goldfinch, you add some more components like a nest box and a water feature. Thrasher, you just add more components and cardinal are our highest level. You're at the highest level. So you're incorporating active water harvesting, nest boxes, no pesticide use, um, lots of native plants, all vegetation layers. But like I said, we'll go over all this. Okay, so the first level um, is hummingbird. So it's the great way to start. A lot of people already have it naturally and they haven't really planned for it. Um, so I'll just go down the list of what you need. So on the left is the checklist for what we're looking for. Um, so for plants, all we ask for are two or more nectar plants or a feeder. It's a great way to get hummingbirds introduced to your yard, get you excited about birds and kind of want and make you want to do more. Um, vegetation layers, uh, we're just asking for one layer. So there are three vegetation layers. So you have your uh, ground cover, um, which is anything less than about three feet. And you have your mid, mid level, which is like three to five feet tall. And then you have your canopy, which is anything really above your head. So we just ask for one vegetation layer. So you can just have a bunch of salvias that are about two to three feet high and that'd be fine. Um, and for removing invasives, uh, we ask you just to learn about the really problematic ones here in Tucson. So buffalo grass, fountain grass, and stink net. Um, and Carrie is way better at identifying these in the field than I am. So do you have any good suggestions on how to, I don't know, take them out or identify them? Yeah, um, with buffalo grass, you do need to be careful with the ID because it can look like some native grasses. Uh, most often it looks like Ceteria or Plains bristle grass. Um, so definitely familiarize yourself with that. Uh, with all of these, you want to make sure you're bagging any seed heads so that those aren't left behind in your landscape. That's the best way to get them out. Um, so yes, it's buffalo grass on the left fountain grass in the middle, which is kind of the, the buffalo grass of our streams and riparian um, and wash environments. And then on the right, that's a new one to town. It's called stink net. Um, and just take some precautions when you remove that because it is a known allergen, um, both respiratory and with skin contact. Um, but yeah, just bag, bag, bag those seed heads. Awesome. Great. Um, and then for water, water is super simple in this step. It can be just a water dish like with the quail babies. Um, if you do have a deeper water dish, please just put some stones in there. Those babies are really small and I've seen a lot of little casualties of those guys. So yeah, just make it so they have a way to get out if it is a, a larger water dish. Um, water for habitat, which is like kind of your rainwater harvesting is optional in this. A lot of people don't have any sort of landscape to move. So that's totally optional. Um, homes and habitat, uh, it's just to learn about. You don't have to implement them as well. I know they're an issue for HOAs. Um, so any of these things that are like HOA restrictions are always negotiable. Just, just let me know and we can work past those kinds of things. Um, and then reduce hazards. Um, if you have a cat, just please keep it indoors. Um, cats kill about one billion birds a year, just in the United States. Um, so they love to hunt for fun. So yeah, just keep cats indoors. And that's it for hummingbird level. Oops. Okay. And then goldfinch. So here, instead of number of plants, we're looking for a patch. So the patch is gonna be five to seven individuals plant plants of at least two species of plants. So you have like five salvia gregii and then maybe six 
I don't know, Goodings Verbena or something, and that'd be, that would be a patch. And patches work really well for, for pollinators to see them because they're larger in one color. Um, they also work well for attracting birds a little bit better than individual plants that are dispersed throughout your landscape. So that's what we're asked for the appropriate plants. Um, we asked for two levels of vegetation. So you could have some ground cover, um, like a Goodings Verbena, and then maybe um, a bee bush, Pelosia gratissima, which is about my height, so five, six feet. So those two would be great and that'd be perfect. Um, the invasives on this one that we're asking you to remove, um, Carrie, do you wanna? Yeah, uh, so the top one is tumbleweed um, or Russian thistle. Uh, the best way to get that is just to take a shovel to its taproot, uh, try to get it before it goes to seed. Uh, the one on the bottom is Sahara mustard. Lots of seeds, and as soon as you see the seeds on the plant, they are viable, and one plant can be packed with thousands of seeds. So again, just bag those. That's it. Awesome. Um, okay, we'll go to the next slide for the water portion. Okay, so water for this one, uh, we're asking for two simple water features. So simple can be um, a dish of water, like I said before. Um, and then this is a, a dish of water with a little water wiggler, which just makes some water movement, which attracts birds um, more readily. Um, and then for water for habitat, we're introducing some passive water harvesting components. Um, so Carrie has done both of these. These are both of Habitat at Home yards that they've implemented, so if you wanna Talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um, when you're looking at passive water harvesting, uh, there's a couple rules to get you started. One is to start at the top. Um, so that's if you have elevational changes on your property, you want to look at capturing them somewhere in that point. Or for a lot of people, it's just the top of their house. Um, so in the picture below, you can see that we just did that along someone's roof drip line. Uh, you can do rock or you don't have to do rock. It really just depends on how much, much water you're capturing from your roof. Um, the more water you introduce, the more likely you are to need rock to prevent erosion, but just start small and see where that gets you. Another thing that we like to do um, with starting small is every plant that we plant, it has a little micro basin. So it's just like a half inch detention basin that really helps the plant to cl collect water and it really helps uh, the plants to become better established. Uh, downspouts are another great place to look for implementing passive water harvesting. Um, and then you can build some basins and, and plant accordingly. Awesome. Um, yeah, and we'll have a lot of information on rainwater harvesting as well um, on our website and in our booklets coming up. Um, so on to the next one is Homes for Habitat. Uh, so you only have to do one nest box here for this level um, and you can choose between bird boxes or bird box or not bird boxes, boxes for others. So this one is a pictures of a Lucy's warbler um, box with babies and a mama. Um, we also have bee boxes you can do, flycatcher boxes, screech owl boxes, um, rock piles for lizards, anything anything will count for this one. So it doesn't have to be bird box if you don't want to. Um, and then protection, we're implementing protection against window strikes in this step. This is the second biggest killer um, of birds, uh, about a billion. Um, yeah, what, I think that's right, yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, just using window clings, um, all sorts of new technology as far as inlets you can put in your window and there's yeah there's various technologies that you can use um, and it can be really simple or it can be really really complex as well all right so thrasher so this is the third level um, so we are asking for three patches at least in this level um, two layers of vegetation um, and the Invasive species that we'd like you to remove in this one are London rocket, puncture vine, and Mathiola. Carrie, take it away. 
same on the others. Um, the London rocket, again, produces a thousand seeds per plant and they're viable as soon as you see them. Um, but any of these, if you see them before they go to seed, just dig them up. Uh, otherwise, if they have seed, be sure to bag. Cool. Um, uh, and then we're also asking for you to kind of recognize weeds that aren't actually weeds. Weeds is a pretty suggestive word. Um, it just means a plant that you don't want there or unexpectedly showed up. So here's some of the native plants that might pop up that you should keep because they have some great benefits to wildlife. Um, let's start with desert chicory. Um, the sunflower family. It's kind of ugly as you can see. Um, the leaves before it blooms. Um, but once it blooms, they're beautiful, really big, not really big, maybe about half an inch white flowers. So those are really great to, to keep around. Um, they're an annual, so they won't be there that long. Um, let's see, let's see. Desert dandelion, it's another one that's beautiful. Looks a little weedy when it first starts, but it turns out to be really beautiful and great for bees and butterflies. Globe mallow we added just in case because it does look a little spirally and weed-like when it's first starting out, but as we all know, globe mallow are beautiful and very beneficial, especially to our native bees. Um, spiderling, which is in the four o'clock family. Um, this is a great ground cover um, and it blooms um, pretty much year round, so it's a great plant to have, especially when there's nothing else blooming as a nectar source. Desert marigold, I know most of you probably won't ever take it out, but if you do see people taking it out, please let them keep it. because They're great, great native plants. Um, and then <laughs> desert broom, uh, <laughs> we all love to hate it, but it is one of the best nectar larval host plants out there. Um, Carrie, is there a good way to have desert broom in your yard without going crazy? Uh, sure. Um, despite popular beliefs, it doesn't have any allergens. It's not wind pollinated. Uh, a couple things about it. Whenever I see it in landscapes with homeowners, I, I usually just have them keep a couple because um, it will take off. So you, it's okay to dig up a couple when they're young. You don't want it to take over. Uh, it tends to do that in landscapes and it's great in restoration for that reason because it is one of the first to to move in and help build up soil properties um but you it's great but you don't want more than a couple on your house so you might have to manage that and then is there something you can buy just the male plant and it doesn't have all the fluffy seeds i've heard that okay. and i think yeah i've heard that okay all right so just some options um, for the water sources, uh, we're adding an out of habitat water feature here. Um, so that is anything that um, like isn't directly in your yard. So you can add a fountain. Um, there's a picture there with a drip irrigation line dripping into a basin. Um, misters are great for hummingbirds. Um, they love to play around in the water. You can set one up to a timer for about an hour and it will be a really interesting and very fun thing to watch. Those guys love just fluttering in the, in the mist. Um, and then we're also um, introducing advanced water harvesting in this as well, but it's optional. So if you wanted to do some sort of active water harvesting, this is the place to do it. Um, and as well as another option for passive is to to remove impervious soils. Um, Carrie, this is Rick and Bess's yard before and after. This is kind of an example of removing impervious soils. <laughs> so, and then uh, I have a slide for that. No, I don't. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. Um, so for nest boxes, we're asking for two. So it's gonna be um, a bird box or, well, bird box and actually, another box for wildlife. So I have some pictures of um, native bee boxes, uh, rock piles for lizards. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of options you can do with 
with homes, which are fun. Bee boxes are super easy and fun to make. Um, Lucy's boxes, flycatcher boxes, kestrel and screech owl boxes, we all have readily available at our nature shop whenever we're open again, but we are selling them online too if you wanted to get one now. Um, and then rock piles are really easy, great for lizards, um, great to have lizards in your yard. A lot of birds really <laughs> like them, so it's a good thing to have. Um, and then an added protection layer is to reduce your insecticide use. Uh, yeah, so the insecticides becoming more and more of a problem. Uh, if you kill off all the insects, your birds are gonna be killed off as well. It's like 97% of all terrestrial birds rely on insects to feed their young. So if, if we're poisoning all the insects, we're kind of cutting off a food source for birds in a big way. So that's, there. oh yeah. Um, so if you're interested in pest management in your yard, the best thing you can do is just plant the greatest variety of plants that you can because native plants have associations um, with particular insects. So the greater diversity of families you use, uh, the more you have that built in pest control. Right, yeah, especially true for native plants. All right, so onto the cardinal level, which is our top level. Um, so for plants, we're looking for a bio-rich nature scape. So that's a, a selection of, of patches. Um, but what we are really looking for are plants that are gonna provide the four food groups for birds here. So nectar plants, fruit and berry plants, plants that produce seeds, and then plants that attract um, insects. So Caterpillar, larval host plants are really great here to use. Um, so that's what we're looking for in this one. Um, let me just make sure that's right. Yeah, and then another component of the BioRich is to make sure that you're providing blooms throughout the year, which is really important, especially in the early, early summer, winter, when, when pollinators are going into hibernation or just emerging and need something to eat immediately. So having planned out and strategically selected plants that will, will bloom throughout the year is, is really important. Um, vegetation layers, we're asking for all three. Um, and then we have some more invasives to remove. Here so on the bottom left there, we have uh, the lovely Bermuda grass. Um, it's very popular in yards here in Tucson. The, best way that we found to remove it is to solarize it, which is to put a plastic sheet over it and it just will bake the roots. Um, however, you can do that if you have, say, a large tree nearby and you're going to affect those roots. Uh, the second picture there is tamarisk. It's not too popular um, in backyards, but it is along riparian areas and it's pretty nasty. Uh, you've just got to dig for a while to get that sucker out. Uh, the third is African sumac or Rus lanthia. Uh, it is taking over a lot of washes despite it being a great shade tree. Um, so it is important to get it out. You just gotta dig that out. Um, and then I can't see the picture on the last one. Oh, uh, it is giant reed. Uh, giant reed. Um, yeah, that one has a pretty big bulbous tuber. Um, and that one's kind of fun to dig out, actually. <laughs> Plant it and Carrie will come dig it out for you. <laughs> All right, thank you. Um, and then for the water, we, the biggest thing here is we're requiring some sort of active water harvesting, um, which is not this slide, it's the next slide. But this slide is an um, example of one of the or two ponds that Carrie and the restoration crew have implemented in two of the houses that they've done. Um, so this would qualify for a in-habitat water feature. So it's a pond, recirculating pond. Um, I saw the process kind of of the pond, so I know it's a lot of work. Carrie, is there some basic steps to help people do this? Sure, you're gonna get how to build a pond in 60 seconds. Okay. Um, so there are two styles there. When you're looking for water for birds, you want water that closely mimics their habitat. 
So you see they're all in-ground features and they have uh, running water, even though it might be difficult to tell. Um, on the one to the right, there's water coming back over the rock that trickles in, um, and they, they're really attracted to that noise. So step one is just to dig out your, your structure, um, invest in a laser level from Harbor Freight. Uh, that's your best friend at this point because you don't want any water to overflow on the edges. Uh, then we laid down carpet uh, to prevent, protect the liner. Um, you don't want any sharp rocks or objects puncturing it because then you have a, a water feature with a leak. Um, so then, <laughs> Uh, so then you have your liner. Um, you have to trench a line for the water to come back. Um, so you install a pump, a filter, and then a float, which regulates uh, the level in your water feature and will automatically top it off if it's tied into a water system. Um, and then you rock it in. Aesthetically, we found over time that it's nice to have different textures. So if you do sand and gravel in the bottom and the bigger rock, along the sides, that looks really nice. Um, but the sand and gravel is also really great for butterflies. Uh, if you've got some, some sand bars built up on the side, they don't like to be standing in the water, but if the, the gravel is wet, they love that, so. Yeah. Yeah, they look great. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and then, sorry, this is the slide about the active water harvesting. Um, these are two basins um, that the rest of your creation crew has craned in one of them um, and then another one. All of them are craned in. Is that the one that, where's the green one? Uh, Roger and Dinah. Oh, is that the one on Indian House Road? Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, so if you want to, I don't know, I don't know if you can summarize this. Sure. And um, so I'll start with that. There is a great rebate program for water cisterns. It's through the city of Tucson, so check out their website. It definitely makes it worthwhile to get one. Um, and if you if you do go that route, they will make you take a class, which will tell you absolutely everything you need to know about installing a cistern or having one installed for you. Uh, so there's two different systems that you see here. Um, the one on the bottom left, you can link up tanks and have one water supply. Uh, it just makes it a lot easier to install. Uh, you can have a pump installed. It's a bit tedious of a process with the city, uh, but it, it's the most efficient way to water your plants. And then you just tap that into your regular irrigation system. Um, on the right, it's just a gravity fed system and they make zero pressure timers that you can hook up to that. And again, just tap that into your irrigation system. Um, as you can see, they're quite large and they really stand out in your landscape. Um, so you kind of have to plan accordingly for that. Uh, you've got to have an overflow point for the water to come out. And so it's a great place to get your, your active and passive harvesting features in one go uh, and then plant accordingly for the basins. Awesome. Okay, uh, for nest boxes, uh, we'd like three and they could be either bird or ones for others. Uh, the first one on the left is a rocket box. So that is for bats. Um, that one holds probably about 1200 bats, individual bats. Um, so we have all these um, plans if you wanted to make one online on our website. These are from Bat Conservation International. Um, there's only about, there's only really two plans that will work here in Tucson um, just because of our inclement weather and the really large fluctuations in our weather. Um, so they need to be bigger, they need to be at least four feet tall to have enough vertical movement for them to actually use the box. So the rocket box is an option and then they also have a four chamber nursery box as well. Um, that's all online as well, but those are the two that would work well here. I have seen a lot at Ace Hardware, um, online, Home Depot, um, that are just really small. Um, those aren't gonna work here. They're not, most likely won't be utilized. So it's kind of a waste of money to put those up. Um, so they need to be a bit bigger. Um, and then below that is a screech owl, 
Western screech owl. Um, and then to the right is a, a log, it's a dead log. But as you can see, there's holes that have been bored into it by either beetles or by like carpenter bees that had taken over those holes. Um, so it can be a really nice architectural feature in your yard as well. And it can be anything. It's really easy to provide shelter and homes for, for pollinators. Um, open bare ground is, would work for um, our ground nesting native bees. So there's a lot of options. You can pick and choose as many as you would like, but we're just asking for three here. Um, reducing all hazards. So keep your cats indoors, put some stickers up on your windows and um, try to eliminate your pesticide use. I showed a picture of our owls um, in their nest box. It's a screenshot as an option for rodenticides. Instead of using a rodenticide, get some screech owls. As you can see, there's probably about, that's like six pack rats in there. So if you need some pack rat management, grab an owl box and they will take care of those for you. Um, so this is a new, new thing. Um, so this is for people who want to go above and beyond in specific ways. So we are offering um, these awesome stickers that we had made by our graphic designer. So if you wanted to make a monarch habitat, you can, we'll have all these resources up on top and checklists for each of these. So you can make one little habitat for monarchs. And if you're super into moths, you can do a moth habitat. You could collect all the stickers. It's kind of like Pokemon, collect all your stickers. Um, so this is a brand new thing that we're offering. I mean, it's a good way to implement some pollinator resources, bats, lizards, cavity nesters, um, dark skies that we're kind of partnering with Dark Skies International with. Um, so yeah, this is something we're super happy about, super excited about. Um, and I think it's taken the program into a really neat and new direction. Um, so if you wanted to register, you can register online at tucsonaudubon.org um, backslash habitat, or you can just go on the main page and go to get involved and it's under that drop down box. Uh, there is a one time fee of $35 if you're a member, $45 if you're a non member. Um, this fee pays for the habitat at home sign that you'll get all the reference materials that you'll get upon registration and it also um, helps support the program it helps it keep running. So that's really important. Um, so when you do register, you get all the materials you're going to need to get started. Um, you'll get the manual, just step by step guide on how to create your habitat in your backyard, recipe cards on how to invite different birds to your backyard, uh, various plant lists for like native bees, butterflies, hummingbirds, moths, um, anything like that. You'll get nest box information, building tools, um, all sorts of really great reference materials. Um, and then a new thing is you're gonna also get access to additional services and in-depth materials online. So we're all, a lot of staff are gonna be working on like detailed videos, how-tos, DIYs, that will only be available for people that have registered for the program. So that's a really nice incentive for registering. Um, and you also get access to our restoration crew. So you can have Carrie and her crew come out and, and do assessments of your yard. She can, they can even implement it. They'll get all the plants. Um, so once you register, you'll have access to that. And um, Carrie will go over the restoration services that they can do for you. Sure. So can be kind of an overwhelming process uh, to get started in all of that. So we're just here to help you um, discuss your goals and tell you where in your yard is the best fit for things. So $50, uh, it's just uh, you send us imagery and we, we tell you what we think um, would work where. Uh, the next step uh, is a video call. Again, we're looking at imagery and then, or you can come to our office and visit. Um, the on-site consults are a great time to just ask us a whole bunch of questions, uh, take as many notes as you can. Um, and then the, the last option is, is the most popular and it's where we come out and we 
go through all the Habitat at Home steps and we determine how they can best match your goals and where they should be implemented and where on your property. Um, we make a ton of plant options available to you uh, for what would go well where. Um, so that jump starts that. And then after that, if you decide you want the crew to install that, um, we, we do do that as well. And the next page shows uh, one of our favorite projects, it's a before and after. Um, we installed an uplands area, so there's lots of saguaro and other cacti, and then lower elevation stuff, some more riparian or wash species uh, that go in there. So just some of our work. Yeah, this yard was, I visited, um, I think, probably about a year ago, and their species list immediately after you guys planted some of these plants was like 30, 28 species on the day that I was there. So yeah, it's fantastic. It's just like planted and they will come and it totally works and it looks beautiful and they're very happy with it. So that's a great job. Um, so things that you can do now, I think this is a thing that um, we're trying to implement after every webinar. So if you leave the webinar, you wanna look forward to doing something. Um, so oddly enough, we're actually having our native plant sale going on right now. So that's just something that you can do right now. Um, so it's a little bit different with the restrictions that we have. So we're doing in pre-order and then curbside pickup. So if you go online to tucsonaudubonnatureshop.com, or you can also find it on our website, um, you can pre-order your plants. There's a drop-down menu that you can pick gallons or quarts. And these are all native plants that have been grown here in Tucson, organically grown um, by a woman named Bernie, who's awesome. And she also supplies all our plants for the restoration projects as well. So if you order them, you can order pre-order from, well, now until the 30th. Um, and then we'll go ahead and get all those orders ready. She'll drop off the plants and then we'll do curbside pickups um, May 4th through 8th. Um, some plant offerings is just a photo of what, what we're offering. Um, it's also online if you want some, um, something to look at right now. So that's something you can do right now. It's a little hot, so we're just making you aware that they're gonna probably need a bit of irrigation and a lot of watering until they get established um, or just plant them a little bit later. But just keep them watered. It is hot, we usually like to do this last month, but with certain times we can't, so we're doing it now. Um, so yeah, that's one thing you can do. And can then, I? Oh, yeah. So I get excited looking at plant lists. So <laughs> if it's okay, I just wanna talk about some of the best plants on here yeah. um, in my mind and what they're good for. Uh, at the top, we have uh, Alothea gratissima bee brush. This is a great seed producing plant and we like to say it's like crack for lesser gold <laughs> Um, so it's a nice green plant. It gets a little tall, uh, lovely white flowers. Uh, it's, a, it's a must. And it smells so good. Yes. Yeah, the name means pleasant smelling in Latin. Uh, and then next, chocolate flower, um, Berlandiera lyrata. That is a really great plant for pollinator gardens. And uh, again, it it actually smells like chocolate, so that's fun. Um, it's a good for, for nocturnal things as well. It tends to bloom into the evening and early morning, and then it closes up a bit. Uh, Caliandra areophylla is all around powerhouse. Larval hosts a lot of things. A uh, great nectar producing plant for hummingbirds and butterflies. Hot bush, if you have any oleanders in your yard, get rid of them and replace it with this guy. It's a great screen plant. Um, Goodings Rubena is another powerhouse for pollinator gardens. Uh, creosote, if you're looking to support nesting birds, um, Luria tridentata, that one is just covered with insects. Uh, yeah, it's a powerhouse. Uh, wolfberry is a great berry producing plant for your Frugivorous birds, and snapdragon vine, if you want to throw a vine in there, uh, great for hummingbirds. Yeah, it's a great one. I was really excited to see um, 
Is it not on here? Lavender Spice. I haven't seen that one in a long time, but that one's awesome. Yeah, so if you have a place in your yard where there's a lot of shade and you're just not sure what to do there, what will grow there, that one will be happy there. So that, that's Good used shade. in a lot of our landscapes as well. And I think it's pretty popular with hummingbirds. Yeah, and it smells really good too. Cool, thank you, Carrie. Sure. Um, yeah, and then this is something that Carrie put together for another thing that you can do. So if you really wanna nerd out a bit and uh, ramp up your habitat at home, uh, I made this inventory for some upcoming workshops. Um, so you just wanna go through and it really helps you to see where your habitat is at. Um, the vegetation layers, if you're, you're covering that component. Um, if it's native, we really recommend native plants just because of their insect associations and also because they do sometimes escape and become invasive, so that's not good. Um, bloom period, by focusing on that, you're, you're seeing if you have a, a great pollinator garden habitat. Um, food production, you're just supporting a great variety of, of wildlife with those different options. And so if you are ready to dive into this, a great resource um, is the website listed below. Uh, I use this all the time. Um, it's going to show you the bloom period under ecology. Uh, so that'll give you that information. It'll sometimes say if it, it produces seeds. Um, it doesn't have a whole lot of wildlife associations in there, so that might take some more digging. Um, but it also tell you where you should plant it in your yard. Uh, for it to be most successful. So for bee bush, favorite, uh, it's found on rock, rocky or gravelly slopes and hills, um, if you see that under the ecology section. So that means that you, you it'll be great um, full sun. Um, if it says washes, you know that you can put it in your basins, etc. So that's really your guide to what will be happy where. Yeah, that's a great website. I found like Lady Bird Johnson's website um, is great for if she has it on her list, but for associations with with wildlife and the benefits to that. So Lady Bird Johnson um, wildflowers lists will tell you that if she has them on her list. So um, I think that's pretty much it. I'll leave this screen up. This is just our contact information. Um, if you want to email kind of all of us, we have a general habitat at tucsonaudubon.org email address. My address is up there as well as Carrie's. Um, don't call us. I don't have my, I'm not at the office, so can't answer your phone. So email is probably the best way to get a hold of us. Um, and when our offices do open back up, uh, I'm located at the university shop. Carrie's usually out in the field. So emailing her is probably the best way to get a hold of her. Um, so yeah, Luke, I think that's it for slides if you want to take over. Yeah, let's do that. Cool. cool. Thank you so much, Cam and Carrie. That was great. We do have a few questions that uh, were asked in the chat um, comments, but um, also if any of you have a question that you'd like to ask right now, go ahead and uh, find the raise hand function there underneath when you click on participants and you can uh, click on raise hand and we'll call on you. But first, um, Ken had a really good question. Um, so in our material, we talk about rem removal of bird of paradise plant, but then we also have are selling Mexican bird of paradise. So um, what are the, what's the, what's the catch there? Uh, yeah, so uh, that is from, yeah, that's our old materials and that was something that probably should not have been there. Uh, the one that we're selling is, is fine. There is an invasive species that we don't really see much here anymore. Um, I think, Carrie, is that the one with the yellow and red stain? Yeah, the, the yellow um, bird of paradise is the one that's considered invasive. Um, the red bird of paradise is all right and a great nectar producer, so. Yeah. Great. Great too, because it, it's one of the few that bloom when it's really, really hot. So yeah, disregard the removing that one. That will not okay. be 
Don't remove the yellow. But do remove the yellow. And that leads me to like the next question that I was thinking as you both were talking and that Lorraine asked as well. Um, so many people registered for Habitat Home, you know, years ago. Um, how would they have access to those, the new material? Are we able to just send that out to everyone who's in the program right now, or do they have to reach out to you? Yeah, so um, I have a current list of when I took over the program, which was like a year ago. Um, I do have new contacts from back when Kendall and Keith were running the program. So if you've got a survey from me asking what stage you think your habitat at, your habitat is at, then you're on my list. Um, I, I'll work on sending out just a general email. Um, I'll send out this week. And if you don't get that, just email me and then I can add you to the list. And when all these new materials are ready, we will give them to you free, of course, um, and add you to any lists or websites that, that will be included in the new stuff. So yeah, we'll get that squared away. Cool. Yeah, I know that Habitat at Home's kind of switched, you know, from different people in the past four or five years since I've been here. And it's very, very good, Kim, to have uh, stability there in you. So it's good. And definitely Lorraine and Ken need that um, that, that new, uh, those new packets. So that's cool. Um, Ilona had a, a question. She, I just uh, saw that. yeah, yeah, she re recently joined. She wanted to make sure she had the new material as well. Yeah. Uh, so I actually was doing all the packets of people who had just registered within the past month. Um, I wasn't able to, well, I drove down to work yesterday, but there was too many people there, so I couldn't stay. Um, so that's all going to be mailed out. I'm going to try to go back in tomorrow when there's only one person in the office so I can not get in trouble for being there um, and practice social distancing. So that will be, I'll get those out in the mail. That's also going to be our older materials um, just because the new manual hasn't been printed yet because no printers are really open at the moment. So yeah, so the materials you'll get is the old manual, but you'll still get the new sign and everything else with your packets. Okay, cool. Um, Lorraine has a question about best irrigation practices for new plants as, you know, things are getting hotter. Carrie. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Um, yeah, you should definitely be watering them. Uh, I like to water mine twice a week now. Um, there is a great resource out there um, called waterusitwisely.com and it walks you through your plant is this big, you need to water it this long um, for this deep. Uh, and we we really recommend drip irrigation. Um, it, it allows it to get down to the roots and really what the root ball is, what you want to do. Cool. Great. <laughs> um, Ed had a question about, uh, he has some plants called Lucky Nut Shrubs, which I've never heard of. That's a pretty cool name. Lucky Nut Shrubs, cool. which are related to oleanders. The birds love them for cover and perching sites. Are they good for birds? So I haven't heard of it either. Um, Lucky nut shrub. I want to look that I'm up now. Hey, Ed, how about, um, let's so see. part of the reasons why we don't like oleander is because it is poisonous um, and it's non-native. Um, so that's our take is that there's always a better native option out there. Um, and that's why we remove them. And I don't know where it's native to, but I did see that it's poisonous. So on that limited knowledge, I would okay. probably remove it. Oh, wow, that's pretty. It kind of looks like a tree version of Tacoma stands. I've never seen that. I'll have to look it up. Ed, would you, I'm gonna unmute you in case you would like to follow up with that at all. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they are related to, what is it, Tacomas? Okay, Tacoma stands, yeah. Yes, um, they came with our house and they, you know, they're hard to get rid of because they grow crazily. <laughs> sure, but they're right next to our bird feeders and the birds love to just sit in them. 
yeah, I, I wouldn't take it out. I don't, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I think they are Central American or South American, and they may be as poisonous as oleanders from what I've read. Yeah, I saw that it was poisonous to dogs. I don't know, Carrie, what do you, what do you think? As long as you don't have a dog. <laughs> uh, I tend to go with if there's a, a native option out there that's better um because that way you're getting the insect associations yeah. which then you're supporting native birds you're not having to worry about it possibly escaping in the future and becoming an invasive um so I I would say replace it with the hop seed <laughs> <laughs> all right thanks Ed yeah, thanks, Ed. That's cool. Um, Mary had a question about uh, any of the plants that were listed that are for sale right now good for containers? i got to find the list. Uh, chocolate flower would be, the penstemon would be, the Goodings Verbena, the Primrose probably. Oh yeah, Primrose. Uh, Desert Marigold was on there, I thought. Yeah. Sammy Anita would be cool. It smells yeah. good. You won't have to water it much. Yeah. Dami Anita is great um, for Western exposures and that heat. So if it's in that setting, it's going to do well there. Yeah. Yeah. And then grasses but, always look nice in containers too. Yes. Any, any questions? Oh, Christina has a question. That's a good question. If we log into our account online, can we see if we're already registered for Habitat at Home? I can't remember if I am or not. That sounds like exactly what I would need to do. <laughs> yeah, through the neon, through neon, I'm assuming? Yes. Well, yeah, so like when you go to the website, you log into your account? On neon? Yeah, when you go to the website, uh, Tucson Up on website, you can, everyone, oh. you have a, an account that you log into when you sign up for something. Oh yeah, it should be, if you have registered, it would be an event called Habitat at Home Registration and it should show up on your profile. Um, Christina, I can look you up if you'd like. And I, I unmuted you, Christina, if you have any follow-up questions with that. Oh no, that, that, that was basically it. Um, I, my memory is, I, I thought I signed up for it, but I'm not sure, so <laughs> I'd like to- <laughs> I understand. To double check. <laughs> and it should be on your, on your profile if you have. Okay, it. cool, yeah. thanks. Huh? Awesome. Any other, anyone else have any questions? All right, I'm, so I'm gonna just share, uh, oh wait, Lorraine's got another question, awesome. Any good summer bloomers in the upcoming sale? Summer bloomers. Mm, the Goodings Verbena blooms most of the year. Um, I think Fairy Duster. I'd have to look at my bloom calendar to answer that more accurately, though. I saw some Fairy Dusters when I was out hiking in Saguaro East uh, a couple weekends ago. They were. My Blackfoot Daisy is still in bloom. Um, yeah, that one would be good. My bee bush has blooms on it right now. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Um, My snapdragon vine's blooming too. So, yeah. Well, awesome. I I do have one last thing I just want to share with everyone. So I I hope that you really enjoyed our class today. Kim and Carrie did an awesome job. Maybe uh, you you can give them a little a little hand clap if you want. There's a reaction thing down at the the bottom that you can you you can use to like do a little hand clap or something like that. <laughs> and I'll, I'll unmute all this here real soon too. But um, so next week, it's not up yet. It's gonna be up very soon. Next week on Tuesday, uh, we are going to have our new restoration program manager, Matthew Lutheran. He's gonna be on with us and um, we're gonna have a little ask a landscape designer time and also get to know Matthew and his new role at Tucson Audubon. Um, but so if you have more questions about how to design your backyard for, for habitat landscape, 
he'll be on to, to talk with us and get to know him and, and uh, what Tucson Audubon is doing even deeper into that habitat landscape process. That'll be a lot of fun. And um, so I'm gonna unmute everyone. Carrie, Kim, you guys have any last things to, to say? No. Feel free to email me anytime you have questions on anything. I'm happy to recommend plants. I love recommending plants. What's your email? khackney at tucsonaudubon.org. And so later today, I'll send out a follow-up email with the recording. And it'll also have Carrie and Kim CC'd on the email. So if you want to reach out to Kim or Carrie, you can do so right from that email I send out later on this afternoon. Because, you know, he erases them after a couple of days. Mm -hmm. I would like to <laughs> hold on to the same. All right. So cool. Thank, thank you all so much. And um, oh, uh, did you have a question? I see a hand up. Do you have a question before we go? I was just saying, I was just going to say, Luke, thank you. I look forward to uh, living here. I just moved down to two back. I, I think I'm a little out of range for Tucson um, to particularly help me with uh, anything, but I look forward to coming up when I can and getting some plants. Great. Yeah, two back's not too far away. That's a beautiful area. I'm glad you're there. Cool. All right. Well, thank you all.